Glenn Fitzpatrick. Thank you for coming and talking to the Sunday Tribune. And we're going to talk about your art. So I wonder if you could tell me how you started off. Yeah, um, quite a funny story. Um, when I uh, <laughs> first started with the art, um, I, I didn't really have much interest in it until I joined the army. And then when I was uh, based out in the desert in the first Gulf War, um, I just sat there doodling a lot in the back of the tank. And, uh, my commander used to look over at me and say, well, you know, um, actually, Fitzy, that's quite good. And I, um, you know, wouldn't you consider being an artist? And uh, I do remember turning around to him and saying, what do you think I want to be like one of those weirdos for? And he just like looked at me and said, no, there's a, you know, there's a lot to it, you know, don't never knock it. So um, things kind of progressed and it, it come up one day, um, I was drawing some motifs and the chap come back up to me again and he said, why don't you draw a little picture on the side of the tank? Why not? Right, so I drew a desert rat with a samurai sword and a big tash and it was quite a fierce looking thing and because I'd done that um, the other commander on their tank looked over and I was like Fitz would you do one for us and I was like well, okay like and then somebody else asked after that and the, the, the third time I said no and they said, well, you know, we'll, we'll give you some, you know, cigarettes and sweets and everything else for it. Because currency had no use in the desert at the time. So really, I found it quite funny. So I, I, I ended up making a quite a little cachet of, you know, sort of um, food and bags. Right, so what currency it would be paid in. But, um, so there's like a troop out there with your art and all different yeah, yeah. ammunition type at the time, Viz was really hot off the press, you know, and um, I started copying all the characters off, off of that, like, and they were just saying, oh, can you put Johnny Fart Pants on the side of a tank? And, you know, and, and some people was even asking me to draw pictures on missiles, and I was just thinking, this is surreal. Right? But um, in all honesty, I actually preferred making art to war, and I... I I really sort of like ignited something within myself that I'd suppressed for a long time. So, because um, my my option with the art world was join it and be poor, or don't join it and you know just have a normal life. And for some reason, I don't seem to get a normal life. So, I picked the creatively poor option so far. So it's like you're fulfilling a dream in a way. Um, yeah, it's. I mean, I'm going to say something which you know, uh, I, I've come to terms with as well. Like, when do you finally admit, like, you're an artist? When do you give in? And in a way, it, it is like um, if you're gay, you get no option, you know, or be that anyway in the LGBT world. Um, finally I've come out as an artist and, uh, and it was so funny when I, I told my parents I think they just looked as horrified you know and I was just like oh my god um, well I better stick to this then like because uh, there's when you, when you come out with it you're at the point of no return and it's you just can't go back I did the same thing when I was a writer <laughs> it's like I've said it and now I've got to do it yeah <laughs> Even though I was doing it, and like you was doing it as well, but now we've got to make it our lives. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, it's, it's important, like because all the time that I wasn't doing it, I was upset. Yeah, you know, and funny enough, uh, a lot of my sort of uh, gay friends that I knew, they were just saying when I was living the other life, I was, I was upset, and I was thinking, yeah, we we've got that in common. We both lived this different life, which wasn't ourselves. Yeah, you need to live your truth, and your mm. truth is your art. Yeah. So when you came out of the army, what happened next? So, uh, um, basically, when I left, I, I done every rotten job under the sun. Like, um, uh, and 
And for some reason, when you leave the army, uh, a lot of people seem to think you're a human forklift truck, right? And you can pick up anything, move anything, and, and you're never going to burn out because somehow you was in the army and you don't burn out, but you do, right? And I just couldn't take it anymore. And it was a, a friend of mine that said he's going to art school, and he said, "Why don't you come along with us?" And I was just, well, well, I'll go to the open day. And um, yeah, I really enjoyed what I saw, you know, and these people was like, you know, doing a life drawing class. And I did a life drawing class on this open day. And it was the first time I ever got real in-depth compliments about the work. And I just thought, wow, this is, this really is my calling. I, I got to stay with it and do it and push this as far as I can go. So. Yeah, I went through an arts education for the next seven years after that and you know, I finally come out of art school with an MA. Well done. And with your MA then obviously you carried on doing your art. But what was your MA in a particular art form or um, mixture? I mean the funniest thing was the, the MA was in fine art, right? So um and it, it, it involved a lot of critical thinking and you know, it showed me other ways to look at, you know, what I'm, you know, sort of like creating, you know, you, you analyse something, you, you, you literally exhaust every option of it, you know, you, you kind of know your subject matter inside out and then you do some theory upon it, you know, just in case someone wants to counter you with that, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I found it all very enlightening it, and it really enriching the subject matter as to where I was going so I'd somewhat gone from um, primitive eyes to someone that was more in tune with where I was at and you know I, I found um, there, there's never a real formula for creativity but as far as formulation goes within art that's as close to it as I could get. And from then on, what was your next stage? Uh, the next stage, like once I'd left art school, um, I, and it's one of those um, army things as well. It's just like, you're here, you've been trained, you're trained to do this now, you will do this. So um, somehow that discipline never leaves you. And, and I was like, right, well, I never gave up the training in the army, as brutal as it was. Um, I'm not going to give up the art world, as brutal as that can be. Uh, and they do have their own, you know, forms of misery in amongst them. But um, you know, it's a rough with a smooth world at the end of the day. So I just knew my life was very different to everyone else's. I had somewhat. A unique narrative within the art world. Right? Um, there wasn't many artists around that, you know, had been to the Gulf and done their MA and survived the war, and also, um, you know, I went through a part of my life where I had to survive brain surgery and I've been run over by a car, and I, and I thought, right, okay, um, I'm very um, full of stories, right. I, I need to really put this pen to paper, so I ended up um, working very hard on lots and lots of drawings, and it was just a day in the life of whatever I do. So um, I ended up writing a book, which was called Arts and Minds, uh, which um, is a whole other quick example. So, so there's one I prepared earlier, and um, yeah, it was just a book that was you know full of anecdotal stories it was all true stories and um, I, I just found there was a way to discover yourself on this arts journey whilst you're really at the beginning of everything once again so you leave education you're you're bursting with ideas but you know is that the real chosen path of yourself, you know. And um, what, with the book, um, 
coming out, it, it gave me that time to reflect and think, right, I've got a structure here, I've got something to work off of. I come to the point where um, I had some leftover sort of like weapons from the, the Gulf War. Right? And, um, you know, I, I had some like, petrol pumps and everything else and I just thought I, I need to make a sculpture that symbolises what I've gone through. So I basically like um, put a knife on the end of a petrol pump, like so. Right. And um, that became my symbol of society. Like, I, I looked at it and it made the hair stand on the back of my neck. And the idea also come from like bayonet practice. So I used to go and fill my car full of petrol and every time I looked at the cap opening and I'm holding this gun-like object and here I am stabbing it into the car and you know, I'm blasting petrol in like, and I'm thinking this is like bayonet drill. So I basically got home and, well I say, put the bayonet on the end and thought, right, title, symbol of society, that's pretty much what it is. And, and it wasn't until I'd done um, an arts application that I thought oh, I need to just cut this down a bit and realise symbol of society is SOS. You know, a, a real cry for help there, you know, and, and a happy accident if you want to call it that. And I, I just took the journey from there. So this was something that um, would be the foundation of my next major project which is still ongoing and that project is called the armory so tell us about the armory uh, right, the armory is a way that i can somewhat um make or uh, put it together um you know analyze what i'm doing um and and it was also a reminder of once again, where I come from. Right? Um, there's another piece of work. See, it all comes. The good thing about cataloging, it all reminds you. So, there's a piece of work that I made, which was called Pumps in a Rack. So, uh, uh, that was just a play on the words. Um, Really, what happened was um, like that happy happy accident again. I, I, uh, I mean, pumps in a rack, pumps in a rack, pumps in a rock. You know, it's sad enough it appears. But it was also the first moment that I looked and realised where I was at with the armoury. So here we've got this row of pumps and that was like going to our own armory, right? All these rows of guns with all these numbers on it. So, yeah, one belongs to you, you know. So you go downstairs, everything's unlocked, and you go in, and the display was flawless. Yeah, you know, it's almost like going into a supermarket for guns. You know, it was just in uniform, in sync, nothing out of place, and it was wonderful. And that's how I thought, yeah, I am literally creating my own armoury here. And then it ended up thinking, I need more weapons. Right, so... Um, As if there's not enough in this world already, but yours are more art weapons, they're not are, weapons that can hurt anybody. Yeah, so, I mean, these are just a metaphor of what goes on you know sort of like but it, it makes you think as to where something is where does it come from what you know what is its purpose function like uh how is it marketed displayed is display art like you know and, and that's the, the other thing that i found is you know um with display display is gallery gallery is art you know it's the, the whole narrative is unfolding beneath you you know and I could really plan this and it, it, so it allowed me to touch upon points like consum consumerism uh, marketing like uh, which is pretty much the same thing but 
also I could get the sort of like weapons culture involved. Um, when I started putting stuff together once again, like the knife culture was still hot off the press, and this is back in 2008. Uh, so, you know, things haven't changed. They've actually they, you know, become more excessive in a way. But, um, yeah, if only we could lock everything up in this armory and have it all away and just use it as a display cabinet, you know. Then we might understand, you know, this is where the art starts to communicate, you know, this is the humanity side of things, you know. And from this, I really needed to look at other avenues, so I've created sculptures, but I also was very interested in current affairs, and I wanted to communicate, like, um, what was happening in our time, you know, um, how we ended up at the credit crunch, how we were ended up on the meltdown, how we've ended up in this point of society now um, that says, you know, we're more vulnerable now than we've ever been. And I found art was the only way that I could communicate this. You know, it, it had a louder voice, uh, a much louder voice than I did in the army anyway. And I was able to reach out beyond myself, right? And in my absence, like while the art is in, you know, or on display, it's still doing like that communication for me. So I felt that was very important. It but is very important. It helps people to see, well, weapons in a, in a different light, and maybe take a step back, exactly as you're yeah. explaining it. But it helps to process, you know. Like, uh, because a, a lot of weapons, like, they're, they're glamorised, you know, you, and, and you hold, the moment you pick up a live weapon, like, um, it's, it's like instant ego change, or, you know, the, it's like the, the chemicals within you, like, uh, uh, altered, like, you, because all of a sudden you've got life and death in your hand, like, you know, and, and that's a real crazy thing that you have to face, you know. Do you take that life or, yeah, and, and some people I've seen, they, you know, was picking up their, their guns and posing with it, you know, I was guilty of that as well, I wanted the photograph of it, you know, like, because of the, I mean, there's all, always that film culture as well that come through, the, the bigger the gun you got, the better it is, you know, so, you know, I, I wanted nothing better than Big Arnold Schwarzenegger Terminator Max 6 Super Oblivion Rifle, if you want to call it that. I did make that name up, by the way, but it sounds good. <laughs> That's going to be your next art piece. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, so, yeah, first. No, but the funniest thing with that was I, I just knew um, with that whole thing, it kept relating back to where I come from. Like, and with all the pens that I've been going through and drawing with and everything else I saved them up and over 10 years I've racked up a serious amount of empty pens but never threw them out and it wasn't um, until the Charlie Hebdo incident that I knew what to do with these pens because of the mass shooting that went on with that um, I, I just if, it was instant. I, I, the, the flash went in my head, you know, the pen, the pen, the pen is mightier than the sword. People have been killed by a bloody machine gun, like on machine guns. Because of something they've done with the pen. Yeah, like, and I just want to, this ain't right. I, I need to convey a message through this, so I made a, a machine gun out of all the empty pens. And, and you know, that, that really was the, the the, the, the coming together of the pen being mighty and the sword is solidified at last and and then I had to sit back and question you know you know once again why you know why is this and um, I, I oh, <laughs> there's many for many against like but I, I come up with something that made sense to me and uh, Charlie had to uh, the organisation was warned by, you know, sort of like, uh, the, the, these people that, that killed them, that, you know, they 
there will be consequences. And I, I believe in the freedom to speech, and I believe in the freedom of satire and everything else. But if it, if it's going to be sort of dangerous, and you know, and you're going to keep poking fun, like sometimes, you know, where is the, the line? You know, so I, I like the fact, you know, that there's the freedom of speech, but it makes me question this. The freedom of speech give you the freedom to offend. And that was a whole new concept for me. And I still question that. So um, I'm in a constant battle with myself. So I'm, I'm not going to uh, be either side. I'm somewhat just want to understand both things and still put the emphasis upon it that by signing the peace treaty, hence the pen, it's still just as mighty. So, once again, that pulled through. And that made me lead on to the next thing, recycling. I didn't realise, like, I've been making artwork that's environmental, it addresses the environment, and I've somewhat been subconsciously recycling, because I, you know, waste nothing. So that was where I headed to next. Like I was looking at the pens and then I just was left with a load of pen lids. You know, what do you do with a load of pen lids? Uh, and I just had a crazy day one day where uh, I got too much super glue once again and I ended up with this skull like creature. Looks a little bit you know, ice age in a way. But um, the funniest thing was, it really gave me that taste for um, saving things. So this is all made from pen lids, isn't it, this skull? Yeah, it's all pen lids. Because a lot of these, you know, sadly with the art um, equipment, it isn't able to be recycled, is it? So this isn't a perfect thing to be doing with stuff that can't be recycled, yeah. turn it into art. Yeah, well, it's, well I mean, the funniest thing is, uh, we, are, we are a wasteful society, and but everything has to be addressed at some point. It's impossible like, to account for literally everything, but if we all sort of like have something in our own little bag that saves something extra, It'll all contribute, it'll all mount up. Something might clean up another thing, you know. And this is something that I learned on a rally through Africa. Like, they waste nothing. Like, even an empty bottle is an extra day's, like, carrying water with them. Like, there's a vessel of survival. And that was something that I really picked up upon. Like, so, a vessel of survival. Maybe you can just put that bottle alone yeah, and display it by itself. And it still communicates what a thousand bottles does. Right, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's life giving. So, like I say, still on the journey, I, I come back home with, you know, new ideas, waste nothing. Right, and, you know, I, I started realising, like, uh, one part of my journey was I used to go walking a lot and as I went walking a lot there's a lot of like the silver canisters laying around like nitrous oxide canisters the cricket well there we go something like this yeah right. you've got one yourself around you good reminder <laughs> yeah. <There's one. laughs> yeah so um so you started collecting these yeah I, I was collecting these um and they was everywhere. Um, when you, you end up with pigeon eye, I'm going to call it. Right? So, believe it or not, when you know what something looks like, you can find it anywhere and everywhere. Right? So, just out the corner of my eye, I would know what it is. And, like, and, and I felt great every time I walked down the road and I found a pile of 10 or 20. I was like, get in. You know, like, and also, like, when you're um, sort of like low on funds, sometimes you've got to live off the land. And I, 
here I am living off the land with a not so organic product. Like, but funny enough, it was to the point where I could pick them up and they'd be there the next week. It's almost like they'd grown again. So I'm picking them up and uh, I really didn't know what, or did not know what to do with these things. But um, it wasn't until I had two dustbin bags full, I thought I want to make something that looks like a knight's helmet. And somehow that's going to bring me back to the armory again. I could put this on display. So I started putting these together and um, I got totally addicted to putting this stuff together for for at least two years. I, I made a lot of uh, heads from them, I made a lot of signs from them. I even made another machine gun with them which would also uh, contribute towards the armory. And oh, I, I just knew once again, this is really coming together. Um, and I'll, I'll somehow get lost now, but I want to just jump over to um, that's it, the Wallace collection. So, after seeing of or going to the Wallace collection, I, I walked around that whole space and I could not believe it. It was just like, where has this been all my life? Why didn't I know about this? You the, know, the armory there. Do you mean the knights and everything? The whole place. The whole place. Like, okay. you know, the opulence. The, the It was just, you know, it was breathtaking. I, I literally walked around and, yeah, you know, I was, oh, it's one of my favourite places. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's words not good enough for it. You know, so. Um, as I walked around there, uh, I was just like, oh my God, this is something that I've always dreamt about. Like, you know, um, if there's going to be a beautiful place that I want, this would be it, you know. And then I got down to the back of it, where the armoury was, like, and I'm looking at all the suits of armour and like, I'm looking at all the display and how, the, and I'm thinking, this is, you know, it, chill went up the back of my neck and I'm like wow this is this is the whole story I've gone full circle like yeah I've got a contemporary version of what they have I've got drawings I've got weapons I've got but it's all for art so um, that's really one of my biggest um, sources of inspiration that brought everything together solidified the armory project and it enabled me to sort of like question what is armour, right? And it it went on a bit more than that because after drawing um, one of the pieces of armour from the collection there, I was just looking at it thinking, well, don't we all wear armour, you know? And that's in many forms, makeup, um, you know, sort of like gloves, uh, you know, skateboard, anything like but we all have this armour, like, and it's an alter ego in a way, you know. So, how do we wear it? How do we address it? Where, what style does it come? But this opened up the doors for me to, you know, not only work on my weapons, it allowed me to look at what is beauty, what is aesthetics, you know, what, what do I consider to be something of like Wallace collection style beauty and I, I'm thinking that's it I, I managed to find the journey that took me from being um, a, a very not so much bloodthirsty squaddy but there was something about me that once upon a time um, I never craved war but I understood it and I needed to learn from this that uh, it's bad it's it's it needs to change we all can change we all can learn like um we can all you know adjust our ways uh, and we can all understand but i i that was a very dark time for me to get from a to b but now i'm on what i consider to be one of the brightest times of my life and that's by finding people that 
wear their own armour and I think, wow, that's beautiful. Can I paint that? And that's where we're at. Well, we all have to go through our dark to find our light, I believe. And you've been through your dark travels that have brought you on to this fantastic art that you do. And I'd like to thank you very much, Glenn. It's been a fantastic interview and I wish you all the best with your art. Thank you. Well, thank you very much.